Hi everyone, I'm Suzanne Clements, one of the pastors at Trinity United Methodist Church in Lafayette, Indiana, and I'm really happy to be sharing this week's message with you all. A couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to participate in a community conversation here in Greater Lafayette that was inspired by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham Jail. Maybe some of you are familiar with Dr. King's letter. Uh, it was written on scraps of paper the week of Easter 1963 uh, when Dr. King had been jailed for a week um, in Birmingham after being arrested for protesting there. Um, he and others were uh, protesting Birmingham businesses that had been discriminating against African Americans. And Dr. King had been marching um, in the street with others, and he was arrested for participating in a mass demonstration, which at that time and that city was against uh, the law. And his letter that he wrote in jail was addressed to eight white clergymen who had written a public letter stating their opposition to Dr. King. Um, they had said in their letter that his activities in Birmingham were, uh, quote, unwise and untimely. Um, they said that he was an outside agitator coming into Birmingham trying to stir up a crisis and that he was being impatient. And they charged him with being an extremist. And these pastors had urged their white and black fellow citizens to withdraw their support from Dr. King. And if you've not ever read Dr. King's letter from Birmingham Jail, um, you can find it online. Um, and it is an amazing and inspiring message of hope and courage and fierce love for others. And I want to share with you a few tidbits from the letter. Well, first, Dr. King explains in his letter that he was actually invited to come to Birmingham by fellow leaders in the black movement. And he writes, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states, and I cannot sit idly by and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all of us indirectly. He also says in another part of the letter, um, he addresses the, the clergyman and he says, you deplore the demonstrations that are taking place but you fail to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. When negotiations failed, we had no alternative except to prepare for direct action and present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before your conscience. And one more section of the letter I want to share with you. Dr. King writes, we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of people willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. The time is always ripe to do right. Well, while I reflect on uh, Reverend King's courage and vision and his ability to stand in the middle of extreme tension and conflict and to even pray for and speak words of love to those who are actively persecuting him, well, I know that I am witnessing someone who is sustained by a higher power someone whose heart and mind were shaped and molded by Christ. Dr. King's vision was the beloved community. He prioritized the well-being of all of his brothers and sisters and siblings, his black neighbors who suffered injustice, as well as his white neighbors uh, whose conscience he was trying to awaken. And he loved all of them with a fierce love 
and agape love that modeled the love that Jesus had for the least and the lost. And Dr. King sought to love like Jesus and to bring into being the kingdom of heaven here on earth, the beloved community. He believed it was possible. A Dr. King had a vibrant hope. And that's also what he believed the church was for, that the beloved community is the church's mission. The church doesn't exist for the sake of the church, he would argue. The church exists to bring beloved community into being by caring for those who are hurting and suffering. So, of course, back in 1963, uh, Dr. King was going to go and be present with his neighbors in Birmingham who were suffering. Because as he states, his purpose was to live a life of love in action. So let's look more closely at what beloved community looks like. Well, we see the beloved community coming to life in Scripture in the earliest illustration of the church recorded in Acts chapter 2. And the earliest gathering of Christians looked very different from the culture that surrounded them. And it was a dog-eat-dog -dog way of life during the first centuries after Jesus in the Roman Empire. Uh, during the time of the early church, it was a, a time of extensive vulnerability and suffering. And especially in urban areas, people lived pretty miserable lives. Uh, villages were crowded, filthy, uh, they were filled with crime uh, and disease, and the mortality rate was very high. And in the midst of these conditions, the early Christians provided a different way of living, a way of life that was marked by mercy and also security. The early Christians worshipped together, they shared meals together, they prayed together, they studied Christ's teachings together, and they took care of each other. And most significantly, we're told that they shared all of their possessions with each other. They shared a common life together so that no one would go without. Everyone's basic needs were met. Theirs was a community of radical mutuality. Um, if even one person was in need, this was a concern for the whole community. What affected one of them affected them all. And in fact, the early church took such good care of each other that there is evidence that the early Christians experienced a significantly higher quality of life and even lived longer than their pagan and their Jewish neighbors. I mean, um, imagine that. Um, and there's historical evidence for this. And not only that, but their lives were um, marked by joy and by gratitude. So it's no wonder, really, that the early church grew by leaps and bounds, even though it was often during this time under persecution. People looked at the early Christians and thought, I want to be part of that. Twice, uh, history tells us that during the period of the early church that the Roman Empire uh, was rocked by pandemics. The first pandemic, which might have been the first emergence of smallpox, well, it hit in the year 165 AD and lasted um, 15 years, which is so long, especially when we think about how long we um, were under the threat of COVID. And it's estimated that up to a third of the population died during this pandemic. And the church actually grew during this time because of the fearless way that Christians took care of the sick who were among them. What would happen is because it would, there was such contagion around, at the first signs of illness, families would actually put a sick a family member out in the street. And then Christians would take them in, give them water and food and shelter, um, and they saved uh, an, an enormous number of lives through their mercy and their caregiving. Uh, such that to the, to the uh, general public, the greater public, it looked like Christians were performing miracles um, as they went about taking care of their neighbors. Um, and they did this also at great risk to themselves. So why would they do such a thing? They clearly had somehow cultivated a fierce commitment to their neighbors, um, especially if, if they were also doing this, um, that in doing so they were exposing themselves in, in such a time of vulnerability.
And at the same time, um, what they were doing uh, was significant. But yet if we think about it, uh, what were they doing? They were sharing shelter and food and water. Um, so pretty simple and ordinary things to be doing, right? And yet at the same time, so hard for human beings to do. I think that these folks sacrificed um, in such a way, right? They, they shared and they lived openly um, because somehow they had changed from the ways of the world around them. They had put on the mind of Christ. Their hearts and minds had been changed from the ways of their culture. Who they were um, had been determined by the shadow of the cross and the hope instilled in them by the risen Christ. Um, as scripture tells us, if Christ is for us, who or what can be against us? And these early Christians certainly sim seem to live with that kind of hope and confidence. And as Dr. King reflected in his jail cell the week of Easter in 1963, um, at first he was disturbed by being called an extremist. Um, but then he thought, you know, wasn't Jesus an extremist for love? You know, Jesus taught, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you. And in his letter to the clergymen who were in opposition to him, Dr. King um, went on to observe, and I'm going to quote a, a section here of the letter. Dr. King writes, So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremist we will be. Will we be extremists for hate or for love? Will, be, will we be extremists for the preservation of justice or for the extension of justice? In that dramatic scene on Calvary's Hill, three men were crucified. We must never forget that all three were crucified for the same crime, the crime of extremism. Two were extremists for immorality, and thus fell below their environment. The other, Jesus Christ, was an extremist for love, truth, and goodness, and thereby rose above his environment. Perhaps we are in dire need of creative extremists. In his life and death and resurrection, Jesus shows us how to love fiercely and courageously, knowing that our life is in God hand, God's hands and that God has us and that even if it doesn't look like it at the moment, all is going to be well. Living in the light of the resurrection, what do we have to fear? How is God pulling us together at Trinity in order to love our neighbors? How can we hear the voices of those around us calling out for mercy and justice? Do we see our neighbors who are vulnerable and hurting? And are we living together as a church in such a way that those around us might look at us and say, they are different. They stand apart. Look at how they practice radical mutuality. Look at how they extend themselves and love each other. They aren't sitting idly by while folks are hurting and in need. Look at them loving their neighbors. And I would ask, when we gather together, is building the beloved community what we're all about? Um, and if it's not primarily what we're all about, mostly what we're all about, how do we move in that direction? Well, I know that I am inspired by the way so many of you at Trinity care for each other, and also care for your neighbors. I am really proud of the 13 Trinity members who traveled to the Lebanon Children's Home yesterday to support the work there of, of those uh, folks caring for our region's most vulnerable children. I'm inspired by those of you who, at a moment's notice, show up to help a church member move their belongings. Just a week before last, I witnessed one of you say to a neighbor, 
I am going to knock on your door every morning to make sure that you are up for your recovery meeting. I'm humbled by those who serve as guardians for church members who have no other family to care for them. I'm proud that so many of you want to be part of anti-racist conversation and learning and that we are a spiritual home for LGBTQ youth. I love that so many of you tend our community garden, another tangible example of serving our neighbors. And I'm inspired by all of you who in your own special way make this church the welcoming and caring family that it is. You truly see each other and you care for each other. And folks come and become part of us because they see that in you. And when these are our shared values, people notice and they want to be part of the meaningful life that God is cultivating here at Trinity. Folks are yearning for meaning in their lives, for hope, for something good and true and lasting to anchor their lives. I think we're hungering for fierce, agape love. I dare say that there is an extreme need uh, for meaning and mercy in our world today. And my prayer for this congregation is that we stay grounded in the steady resurrection hope of Easter and that we increase our commitment to study and internalize our faith together. May we live joyfully, sacrificially, and fearlessly like the earliest Christians did. May God's Spirit provide us with an extreme creativity as we seek to love our neighbors, especially our neighbors who are hurting. And may we cultivate authentic, ongoing relationships of mutuality with our neighbors, um, not just a network of contacts that elevates our standing in the community. And it doesn't take rocket science to do this. You know, mostly we're called simply to live our ordinary lives in mutually loving ways. But as we know, this is harder than it sounds. It can be messy and it can be really hard. We need each other's encouragement and God's grace to love fiercely like Jesus. But with God's help, we will. And God will continue to mold us and God will continue to, to build the beloved community right here through our ordinary and blessed lives. Amen.